some of those today, but the rest in the upcoming weeks. And before I introduce our expert panel, I do want to mention very briefly two new training tools that we've put together just in the past month. You can see on your slide there, ACAM's AML Foundations. This is, in our view, uh, a, there was a crying need within the industry. You came to us and said that the CAM certification has obviously uh, been there for 10 plus years, well respected by regulators, law enforcement, and the industry. We need something for entry level employees, people that aren't yet ready for the CAMS exam. So we've created ACAMS AML Foundations. As we say here, it is a stepping stone for entry level employees, but also for those that are not ready for CAMS in the AML space, but also those that are in the business line that need to know more than just general information on anti money laundering and financial crime. To learn more, please go online to acams.org backslash AML Foundations. Also, another item that uh, we put together based on feedback directly from the industry was uh, AML general awareness. And this is, as it seems, this is a program designed for everybody at the institution. The requirements that you have on an annual basis to assess uh, your whole staff's view and understanding of the basics of anti-money loaning financial crime. This is AML training, we believe it will satisfy everyone from the regulators to senior management. To learn more, acams.org backslash AML general awareness. Here's our panel for today, and I, I have to say before I introduce the three of them, I am really both proud and excited uh, to have this program, but all the work that they've done to help us put together the CAMS FCI program. Our panelists today have helped us as faculty members, as developers, as creators, and gave us the insight that we needed to put the program together. As I mentioned today, we are going to talk about creating the FIU, and they all have experience in there as well. But I do want to just say up front how invaluable they have all been to the organization. Let me introduce them uh, very quickly. We have Jim Candelmo. Jim is the Executive Compliance Director and BSA AML Officer for Ally Financial Services. In that role, Jim's responsible for AML investigations, operations, programs, and global sanctions. Before Jim joined Ally, he was the Deputy Criminal Chief for Terrorism and National Security for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Raleigh. In addition to Jim, we have Dennis Lormel. Dennis is the President and CEO of DML Associates. That's a full-service investigative consultancy. Dennis has been doing that ever since he left earlier in the last decade, the FBI, where he was the first director of FBI's TFOS. He established and directed the FBI's terrorist financing initiatives following the terrorist attacks of September 11th. For his, for his visionary contributions, Dennis received numerous commendations and awards to include the Department of Justice Criminal Divisions Award. And last but not least, Angel Wynn. Angel is the Vice President in Enterprise AML Operations and the Financial Intelligence Unit at American Express. The team that she puts together there support the SAR process at Amex in all aspects, including the development and implementation of surveillance rules to detect suspicious activity, creating procedures and guidance for reporting that same suspicious activity. Prior to joining Amex in January of 2008, Angel spent six and a half years in the Manhattan DA's office as an assistant district attorney in the trial division. And during her time in that office, investigated and prosecuted a broad variety of cases including, of course, financial crime. I'm very pleased to have all three of these individuals with us today. And as we dive into this program, we want to start off with a polling question. I want to say up front, with 5,000 of you uh, dialed in today, the polling questions, you'll see a partial response uh, on your screens. The full responses will be available in the next couple of days. But let's start off with the first polling question. How many years have you been involved in financial crime investigations? Zero to three, three to six, or over six? And in what area? Public, law enforcement sector, private sector financial institutions, or a combination of both? So we'll come back in a little bit to in, it'll give you at least a partial response to the polling questions, but we will give you a full response in the next uh, several days. But please uh, take a moment to respond to the polling question. Now, what I want to do now is manage expectations for today. While we only have an hour, although I might say up front, we may go a little bit over the hour uh, because there's so much to cover, and I do want to make sure that all the panelists have a chance to weigh in on all the uh, issues that we plan to address today. 
But today, during this webinar, we're going to describe the scope and function of FIUs, not just within large institutions, but all size institutions. We're going to give you tips to develop efficient, intuitive investigations and how FIUs should prioritize responsibilities. What skills are you going to need to develop effective onboarding and training? And as we all know from the enforcement actions, training has been a big deficit within many financial institutions, especially in the past couple of years. Analysis of the pros and cons, of centralizing, centralizing the SAR process, and we are going to give you a quick snapshot, as I mentioned, of the CAMS FCI credential, because we believe that that's going to advance the skills of AML and financial crime prevention professionals around the globe. We've already begun the school. Uh, we had an excellent first start. The next one is in November. We are going to spend a few moments talking about that as well. Now, CAMS FCI, what is it? It's a certification program. You have to have had the CAM certification first. Uh, Angel, I'm going to ask you to weigh in here because part of uh, your, your assistance in putting this together was we had to make sure that the certification was relevant to a whole series of different types of skill sets within the financial institution and, frankly, within uh, firms and agencies as well. Can you talk a little bit about the, about the design of the program and who it's applicable toward? Absolutely. Um, kind of the main question that we asked um, when developing the question was obviously who the audience is. Um, and we brainstormed a lot as a group um, around what we were seeing in terms of um, a deficiency or a need um, with the various talent levels that we were seeing either applying um, to different positions within financial intelligence units or um, compliance programs that involved AML, um, and also what we were uh, receiving as feedback from our current employees. Uh, people who have either come from a public sector to a private sector, people who had been in certain positions for a period of time, and really thought through what it was that people were looking for and what we uh, at a leadership level were looking for to build stronger AML programs. Um, and in trying to find a way to answer both of those needs, uh, we addressed a lot of them um, in this advanced certification, uh, financial crime certification uh, uh, program. Uh, so with it, we, we agreed that we would start off with the base level, that anyone who would qualify for this particular program would have a very strong understanding uh, of investigations in general. Um, a lot of people come into different financial institutions from law enforcement or having a lot of years of experience in investigations and are, are here to obviously adhere to kind of the bigger picture question um, of, of preventing money laundering um, and have a passion for investigations. Uh, but the next question was what's next for those people um, and what's the need uh, from a financial institution perspective. And so a lot of the courses um, and a lot of the questions that we asked uh, and the needs that we were hearing were answered by this program. So as you can see on the slide now, it's not just about investigations. It's the understanding that we have our core strong investigative backgrounds and, and then what? And so it's investigations plus. It's thinking about the bigger picture. It's taking investigators and people who understand and know the issues that will arise when looking at any sort of AML issue um, and thinking about it from a program perspective. Uh, what data do you need? Um, how are you going to think about implementing strong investigative techniques and strong investigative foundation into an AML program that is going to um, be successful, that's going to pass the muster of regulators, pass the muster for audit? Most importantly, ensure that we are all, from a financial institution perspective, doing the right thing and assisting law enforcement uh, with what they need to do, because at the end of the day, that's what we're all here to do. Um, think about strategic planning. At the core of every ML program is that investigative practice. But how do we now use that to strategize in building our programs and building in building our financial intelligence units um, and building the, the AML process? Um, thinking about how do we educate people within the organization, um, board members, business units, partners, um, people who may not have that core understanding of why AML is in place 
and what the reasons behind it are. How do we take our program that we've built for our individualized financial institutions and report that out and explain that and present that to um, members of our community or our institutions uh, that may not have that understanding and, and explain the relevance of it? Building relationships with law enforcement. This part of it is extremely important because it allows us to gain intelligence. It allows us to then tailor our, our AML program in a way that is relevant, and that's something that a lot of the regulators and auditors are looking for these days. At the end of it all, it's also thinking about how do we not only build this but also maintain and, and maintain the program and continue to enhance it going forward cultivating and flourishing an investigative environment that will um, be that will become a strong AML program and also ensure that our strong investigators are staying on and becoming managers and leaders on that one and uh, we can show the the poll results whenever uh, we were able to put that up there um, as you can see uh, in terms of the response we have, uh, it's pretty interesting. Between zero and three and over six years, pretty evenly distributed. And then uh, we do have some uh, public sector folks here, but obviously the lion's share of folks, at least to the respondents that we were able to produce here, are the private or financial institution sector, which is excellent. Uh, Jim, I want to bring you in the conversation. When we talk about maybe the last point here, paying it forward, and then what um, Angel just mentioned, and that's both – uh, retaining uh, your employees that you're brought in to deal to work in the FIU, but also to give them, um, I guess, a career path so that if they want to become managers, you want to provide that training for them. Talk a little bit about the importance of not only training your folks when they enter your institution, but how do you keep them engaged? How do you keep them uh, in the institution? You know, one of the things we've seen in the AML world, and I think we're all generally aware of this, is a lot of folks have been jumping around. And that's because there isn't maybe the qualified pool we hope for. This CAMS FCI, we certainly devi we devised this in the hopes that it would uh, expand the pool of qualified folks and maybe not make that uh, so simple for people to jump, jump institutions because then it harms the institution where that employee is left. But, Jim, talk a little bit about the importance of keeping people and, make, and making sure they progress in their careers. Yeah, John, I, I, whenever we all get together – uh, retention is always brought up, and, and I think, and I think we all agree that one of the reasons retention is always brought up is our ability to influence regulatory expectations might be a little more limited. Our ability to to grasp data and manipulate it might be a little have, have greater dependencies. But this retention issue, this is the one that seems to confound uh, folks the most because, I, and I think the reason being is it's the one we feel that we can do something about. Uh, but then what's in the toolbox? And, and I think the great thing about the credential is you're sending a message to the employee that you value uh, that person, that you're investing in that person in an extremely tangible way. Uh, and uh, we certainly heard that feedback from, from uh, uh, the participant we sent to the first inaugural class. Uh, but, but I think, John, getting to your, the, the second point, with this we're actually creating uh, – a, a path uh, inside the industry uh, for that investigator. It, it could have been a little sporadic uh, and, and, uh, and, and great variance from institution to institution. I think by leading with this credential uh, and, and creating it, I think you're creating a career path for that person, and, and a lot of times people don't want to go. But the company needs some type of objective criteria to justify the promotion, the pay, uh, the retention, the things that come along with retention. And I think this, this, this certification goes a long way to, to addressing both, you know, sending that message to the employee about value, which helps in retention of itself, and then also creating a, a career path inside the industry. Uh, that that makes retention a whole lot easier from that side. So uh, we've had great success with it, and and uh, and, and uh, I, I think the the big part of that that cannot be understated as far as the credential. All right, Angel, um, we're trying to figure out who this is applicable toward, right? And as we put the program together, you and Dennis and Jim and many others that helped us put this together tried to get a sense of uh, besides the. Um, the uh, roles and responsibilities that we mentioned up front, you know, mid-level folks, investigators, compliance people. Uh, the question was, what skills did you have that this program could help advance those skills? So talk a little bit about 
uh, how people on the call today can determine whether FCI is for them? Sure. Um, a lot of the things that we discuss, and I think we're going to go through the agenda um, from the last FCI course, um, are, are more detailed discussions around bigger picture issues um, that arise out of, of course, our financial investigations program at various financial institutions. Um, so a lot of some of the questions we may ask is, you know, have you had a have you had experience in financial investigations? So the the course really begins with an understanding that anyone who attends um, has been involved in investigations and, and knows how to um, walk through an investigative process. Um, some people may have done that and then started to assist in gathering documentation for internal uh, audit and external examinations with regulators. And so starting to understand a little bit more about how investigations and the decisioning in the SAR process impacts those various investigations. Um, so some people may have some experience with that. Um, whether or not uh, uh, law enforcement has worked with financial institutions on larger investigations. So um, the hope is really to ensure that we have a broad mix of people within the class to uh, have fruitful conversations from different perspectives. Um, and I think in the last class we had a really great mix of people from different financial industries as well as uh, different institutions of, of, of different sizes. Um, so we were able to really discuss and flush out a lot of issues that applied um, from from an exam perspective and also from an investigative program perspective um, and how we could address those things going forward and, and how certain people would be able to move on to the next level. Um, a lot of the work that's done on an investigative level is often presented at the board. The decisioning on the SAR process is presented to various boards and leadership. Um, so perhaps people who have been involved in trying to gather that data, metrics and so on for reporting. Um, and, and, of course, a lot of times the investigator on kind of the front line, kind of the first level investigator, if you will, will often go through a case um, and get some exposure to what may happen internally uh, with that case. But what happens to it after the, the case has been closed? And how does that affect the larger program? Um, and then finally, kind of, you know, a, a, a fun thing that I hear a lot from, from investigators uh, and even managers uh, that, that rise up within my organization is, you know, I love investigations, I love what I'm doing, uh, but it seems like the career path to advance to a management level, um, I'd have to leave investigations. Um, so this is a way to kind of make a case for yourself and think about how uh, your love of investigations would then translate into a larger program. Thanks, Angel. Uh, Dennis, you've spent a good portion of your career both at the FBI and since then doing training for the public and the private sector. And while the the content that we've, we're, di we're displaying right now may be modified a bit, and that's part of the value and the beauty of our school is that after we go through something, the faculty and the subject matter experts uh, tweak some things, add some things, modify. But at least from the last school that we put together, can you talk a little bit about uh, the content of the program? I think I want to say up front, I don't think I mentioned this when we started uh, today, but this is not a lecture-related program. These, this is a three-day school, some lecture, a lot of table exercises, extensive interaction with the faculty and your peers, and at the end of the program, to, to, to assess whether or not you've succeeded, you have to do a paper, which we think adds not only to the thought leadership for the ACAMS community, but also forces you to document your understanding, to work closely with faculty, to produce quality uh, that is a real a testament to that you learn through that program and you're, you're building on, uh, on your previous skills. But Dennis, talk a little bit about some of the... Uh, the things that uh, folks can expect to learn at the school, but also what you've seen that's worked uh, in, in your previous uh, training, again, that you've done both in the private and the public sector. Yeah, John. Um, you know, I, was, I was really pleased with where we, where we wound up because we had so much great content. And to your point, um, it wasn't just lecture. It was learning. It was actual roll up your sleeves and do the practical exercise. And and people's willingness to learn from that and people's willingness. Um, you know, one of the things, I just to digress a little bit, that to kind of set the stage uh, a little better for this answer, is experience. 
Um, it's interesting. You had the poll question, and you see the, the breakdown between little experience and a lot of experience. Um, I've been conducting investigations for over 40 years, and I came away from this class learning new things that I were, were to appreciate different perspectives better. And I think that's really important that you never stop learning, that regardless of how much experience or how little experience you've got, you've got to continue to build that experience, and, and, and training is one of the best tools to do that. And, and, in, and in that context, and I think one of the things that, that we came out of from this exercise and this 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 class was the fact that um, as you progress and and as your experience um, broadens, to rely more and more on your investigative intuition and instincts and and how important that is. And I think we stress that um, during the class is is to use your investigative experience um, and 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 leverage that experience going forward when you deal with new challenges. But Clearly, as you can see from the slide here, we had an awful lot of areas um, that we covered, and interdispersed in all of that were investigative techniques. Um, you know, how do you conduct investigations? What do you do, and when do you do it? Um, and talking about the interview process, for instance, with the interview techniques, um, and, and actually conducting um, some interviews. We had uh, role plays, and and that turned out to be really good. And then when we got into the discussion, for instance, when we started, we had the SAR, uh, Angel led us through the SAR STR workshop, um, and it was building, you know, the, the proper kind of SAR, an investigative SAR, and, and talking about that process and winding up with the, uh, the you know, the FIU build-out and what is an FIU and, and how important it is. And, you know, to that point, um, to, to, to me, when, when Angel talked about strategic uh, intelligence, um, you know, there's there's strategic planning, um, there's tactical intelligence, and 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 there's you know kind of traditional books and records type of investigations that we do, and and so you know you tie all of that together, and and it you know it 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 was a very good program. And to your point, and and we'll move on. Um, you know, th this is a work in progress, and we got a lot of good feedback from the people in the class, which will enable us. To, to, to kind of retool a little bit as we go forward, and we expect the same thing with the next class. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. And uh, folks out there, we're going to now dive into the topic that uh, we want to discuss. Again, this topic will be dissected and in very great detail at the school. And that's how the role of the FIU and how to build the FIU and, and how it changes depending on the size of the institution. So I'm going to turn this uh, over to Angel, and, and then the panelists will weigh in as well. But let's uh, Angel, let's talk about you and Jim have had specific uh, uh, direct experience with both building uh, and making sure that the FIU is not just relevant, but it's an important part of the institution. And obviously, Dennis has worked with clients that have had to build these out. So talk. let's talk a little bit about what an FIU, not so much what it is, but the strategy behind it, and uh, let's uh, go from there. Sure. Um, and and you know, with the strategy behind it, and we're going to get into that a little bit later too, um, is really understanding what the FIU you want to build is. What's the purpose behind it? Um, and what are we all here to do? And at the core of it, um, when I came to American Express, there was no FIU. And I think the, the um, creation of it uh, was really to respond to the regulatory environment um, at the time uh, for us and then also as it was growing within the community. Um, and there was a need to truly understand the vulnerabilities of all of the products and a need to understand the data points that we were able to gather together from an investigative perspective. Um, and, you know, FinCEN's message is up there. I, you know, we've all seen it and heard it. Um, and at the core of, of any FIU is really understanding what that purpose and mission is across the board um, and really understanding why an FIU needs to be built or should be built within your financial institution. How and the details we'll get into later, and that's all part of the strategizing in terms of what you want the FIU to cover. Um, and at the end of it, it's about the investigative process and building on that foundation. So, Dennis, let's talk about the foundation and the factors there. Uh, again, based on your experience, this has been important. I have to continue to emphasize this, both for the private and public sector. So investigative skills, while they may be a little bit different, 
um, if you're in an institution versus you're in law enforcement, there's a lot of themes that are, are pretty much the same. So can you give us a sense of what's important when you're conducting a financial investigation? Sure, John. And, and we kind of broke it down the way it is on the uh, screen in, in terms of four factors to look at, and that's developing first an investigative mindset, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, I think, on the next slide. So um, I'll, I'll let that go a bit. Um, and, and understanding an investigative process. Uh, there is a process, and, and, it's, and, and, and I look at that kind of twofold as to, you know, who, what are we going to investigate, who, who who to investigate, you know, um, how do we investigate, uh, evaluating evidence uh, or information that we need to look at, uh, reporting, and what's the end game? Because when you're dealing in financial crimes, there's an end game, um, an end game for your institution, um, an end game in terms of the people you're dealing with um, who are committing the fraud. And then clearly, I mentioned before, investigative intuition. As you build your investigative experience, uh, relying on your intuition is really important. And then you, you you need to look at and, and look through an investigation, and there needs to be follow-up. There needs to be vigilance. Is there more to a case? Um, oftentimes, one institution has fragmented information that other institutions are also being victimized and, and used to facilitate frauds. So it's, it's looking beyond what you have to, to, to pay basically what you don't know and, and to be able to build that all in together. And then, um, you know, in terms, I said, uh, of an investigative mindset, all too often in financial institutions what you've got is basically a check-the-box mentality and, and basically investigators don't think outside the box in a sense and, 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 and they don't have an investigative mindset. They don't have um, a sense of professional skepticism because they want to make they just want to check the box and, and move on, and that's wrong. And, and so we need to develop that investigative mindset. And it's one of the things throughout this class that, that we emphasize, regardless of if it's the SAR exercise or the major case exercise, is to develop that investigative mindset, to look under every rock. That means you've got to understand the crime problems. You've got to understand how the bad guys think. We want to get into the heads of the fraudsters. So how do they think and and, and by us being able to, to think like them, we can understand how they're going to um, use your institution to facilitate their crimes. And, hey, Dennis, clearly, Dennis, on that yes. one, how do you do yep. that? How do you try to figure out how they think? Is it, is it research? Is it interviews? You know, obviously you spent many years at the FBI, so you, you had experience in dealing with all sorts of different types of financial crime. But how does an FIU that's being created – whether it's the managers or the investigators, how do you understand how bad guys think? What's what do you recommend? Uh, definitely case studies, and and Jim, you should weigh in here too with your prosecutive background. Um, I, I, in in my experience, it was always, you know, I, I had the ability to work in, in the uh, good or bad fortune to work some of the most notable con men uh, of of different ages, and and there was like Robert Vesco. Um, and, and people like that, Gaith Ferrone. And when you look at the totality of the things they did, you just study that and, and, and go back to cases of people similar to that and follow those case studies. I, I like to get indictments um, and, and prosecutive reports or, or, or court filings and follow the, the statement. Uh, there's usually um, a statement of facts. And I, I use the statement of facts, and then I build that against my institution in terms of how that that person could have used um, that 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 type of scheme to to exploit my institution and and by by putting together those kinds of case studies and I do a lot of training on case studies uh, I I think you start to build that pattern and it goes to that building that that investigative experience and and also then to start to rely on your instincts and and your intuition because of that experience. Yeah, Jim, Jim is, that, you... uh, is that something that you, you're able to bring in from your previous life or and people that you've hired as well? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, know you, you, you go into some departments. I remember as a, being a prosecutor, you go into some departments and you can see they're populated by all former law enforcement. Sometimes they're populated by all industry folks. I, my, my experience has been that, that, that diversity of investigative background, some that you've you know, brought up from a former teller, uh, to uh, uh, law law, retired law enforcement, to somebody who's been doing investigations, maybe fraud work, 
uh, for years. I think, you know, when we've got to think about this, and, and you understand the, the money laundering and fraud and the connections that we that we have, you know, it's constantly changing. And, and the one thing I think that's implicit in this, everything that you see on the screen is speed. You know, speed to identify. So it's speed from the investigator. Can they identify it quickly? And then speed to communicate throughout your organization. Uh, you know. Uh, Somebody seeing something, they don't know what it means. Well, three cubes over, somebody does know what it means or has a suspicion or they escalate it. Or we talk to law enforcement, we've got a, a relationship that really works. So, you know, when you add, when you talk about vigilance, I think that Dennis talks about detection and everything's going to change. Whatever typology we're going to come out with today or tomorrow or the next day, uh, the, the fraudsters, they're, 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 they're going to change, uh, and, and, or the money launderers, they're going to change. And the thing that we just have to understand is that we have to be looking for that change. We have to have that mindset of what they're thinking about. And then we, uh, and very importantly, we've got to be able to communicate throughout our organization if we see a change or an anomaly and, then, and how that works. John, if I well, Dennis, then back, going back to, this, some, to the mindset, you, talk about risk and, and vulnerability as well. Oh yeah, well you've got to understand risk, and that's you know to the point that Jim made is is you've got to know what your institutional risk is, and and understand that the bad guys are going to exploit those risks in areas of vulnerability. And and to Jim's point, the bad guy, you know, as 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 we identify schemes and we close gaps, they're looking to penetrate other areas, and and so they're going to modify and adapt and change their 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 scheme so you know in addition to you know following the case studies you've also got to do the trend analysis and and to that goes to the strategic planning and and the using the financial intelligence we have in terms of suspicious activity reports you know in terms of financial intelligence that we can develop in an FIU um, is really important to identify those areas of vulnerability and emerging trends and so the, the, the emerging trends is, is really important. And to one of the other points that Jim made, which I think is great about speed, I call it a sense of urgency. Uh, when I was leading investigations, I always talked about having a sense of urgency. And, and you know, in, in financial investigations, they're sometimes very, um, they can be cumbersome and, and slow paced. And it's important that you always have a sense of urgency when you're conducting an investigation. So uh, as we move on, we have another polling question, and this question is, does your financial institution or your agency have a financial intelligence unit or central intelligence team? It's a yes or no answer. So we will uh, uh, have you respond to that, and we'll come back in a few moments with, uh, with the response there. What I'd like to do now is uh, uh, turn back to Angel, and Angel is uh, um, she really knows how to get to me because she has all these baseball analogies coming up. And Dennis and I and Jim we're all big baseball fans. So for those of you that are not, just uh, substitute the soccer or whatever sport you like for the analogies that we're going to use. But um, Angel, we've got to talk about we have the foundation. Now what do we do? Uh, so let me let me turn it to you to steer the conversation as we kind of go to next steps after we build the foundation to create the FIU, but now there's much more to be done. Absolutely. And and at the at the first step of it really is around all of those things that Dennis and Jim just talked about, um, how do we incorporate that into a financial institution that doesn't necessarily have, um, you know, time and has to adhere to uh, regulatory demands and internal demands, and how do we take these investigative factors and mindset, and how do we incorporate that into a unit that will be built within a private sector and a financial institution um, in order to ensure that we are building out a program that, that is sound and will protect the, the institution. Um, and, you know, things to consider when balancing the investigation process, investigative process uh, with the needs and demands of a private financial institution or organization um, is you should know your financial institution. What are your products? What are your services? How large is your customer base? 
Um, how, how many transactions are you seeing in any given point in time? What are the various types of transactions you're seeing? What are the processes on the customer service level um, are you able to leverage data from? Um, at the end of it, and, and one of the probably most important things that any financial institution um, in the private sector is looking for is prioritization What and, and risk level and risk assessment. Um, of all of these products and of all of the customers, how, how is the financial institution prioritizing? And a lot of that is um, not only driven by internal forces, but also external forces. Um, every financial institution will be regulated. Uh, every financial institution has its own um, uh, checks and balances. And so um, you have to be able to answer to those things. Um, and part of that is defining that scope. So if you know that you have two products within your financial institution and your customer base is very small, your FIU may be able to handle a lot more than what a larger uh, organization might be able to handle. And all of that will play into how you decide to structure. Do I have a separate investigative unit? Um, do I have an investigative unit that goes up to a reporting structure that's different than a more operational unit? Do I try to combine the two? Um, to me, I think at the core of a financial intelligence unit, and it is really around centralizing as much data as possible in order to maximize the analysis and maximize the impact uh, you may have as a financial intelligence unit. Um, when we think about it, uh, financial intelligence unit has a key term intelligence in it. Uh, a lot of people will sometimes uh, call a financial intelligence unit a financial investigative unit. I always catch myself trying to correct everybody because those two things have very different connotations and very different meanings and very different responsibilities. And so um, when thinking about how to build an intelligence unit within your financial institution, it is of utmost importance to understand how the organization is structured, how large it is. Um, are we in a little league, and that, that means a small organization? Are we a minor league, mid-size organization? Um, and are, or are we at the major league level, large uh, organization? Uh, and thinking through how the structure uh, how should, is best suited for your, your organization. Um, some things to think about in, in considering that structure is data, um, legal relationships, um, some smaller institutions may all fall under one legal entity. Um, medium to large institutions may fall under more than one legal ent entity, and that will impact what data your investigators will have access to and therefore what those investigative procedures can look like and how and if you can centralize intelligence uh, in order to um, properly report back or centralize an overall decision-making process because that's equally as important as well. Uh, Angel, the the poll tells us that a good number of folks on the call do do have a financial uh, intelligence unit or central intelligence team. But I want to go back and have the panel weigh in on this. When you talk about a small somebody from a small institution who's on the call, and and we know the challenges that community banks in the United States and globally have. You know that compliance person has wears wears many many hats. So is a financial intelligence unit really logical, or is it more what a financial intelligence unit should be doing? In other, in other words, um, we may, I may not have a unit per se, but I am doing what you just described. I am gathering information. I am uh, trying to connect the dots internally and all of that. So is it, is it, is it more semantics for a smaller institution? And, and really, what are the regulatory expectations uh, for those folks? Because, again, they just have so many things they have to worry about. They have consumer requirements. They obviously have the basic AML requirements, and, you know, typically the resources are pretty strapped. What would you recommend for that group? If they can't create a unit, is it just, is it just simply more important that they are covering the areas that you mentioned? Absolutely. Um, at the end of it, you can call it whatever you want, but it's about having a uh, centralized point of view uh, of the data and the processes, the risks, uh, and the ability to analyze that in one place. Um, so 
when you have kind of stratified or siloed uh, information channels, and those silos don't talk to each other, is where you're going to be where you're going to be at, at most risk because you're not going to have the full picture um, of of what your overall financial institution's program looks like. Um, and in a any financial institution, regardless of size, I think the regulatory expectation more and more uh, is becoming that at some point some group needs to understand the overall risk of the organization across all of the products. We hear off a lot, are you, you know, monitoring activity across all of your business lines and across all of your products? Um, are you able to identify patterns of behavior that may lead to potentially suspicious activity? Um, and are you connecting the dots among your various teams? Um, so regardless of whether we call it a financial intelligence unit or um, a compliance officer, sometimes one person, right? But so long as there's a centralized place where you can have a bird's eye view of what's going on within the organization from an AML perspective, I think is what we're talking about. How do we get to that point so we really understand uh, our institution and its risks? And Dennis, I'm going to ask you to wait in a second. But this is our last polling question. The last polling question, again, to determine in the audience what's the size of your institution? Is it small, medium, or large? And you, you heard how Angel described the various challenges those institutions will have. And then what type of institution, uh, traditional bank, your credit card bank, or your combination? Uh, and then, uh, or, or e-bank, there is also a, um, on the uh, poll itself, other. So if you're with uh, law enforcement or you're with a firm, check that box. But we'll leave that polling question up for a few moments. But Dennis, uh, from clients that you've worked with, to Angel's point, it, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's about having an enterprise or holistic view of the institution. What sort of challenges do the mid- and small size institutions have that obviously perhaps the large banks don't have because they, they may have the resources and the staffing uh, to create these units, to create these teams, but in the other types of institutions they don't. And so what sort of uh, recommendations and counsel do you have for them? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a good question, John. It, you know, and it, and it goes to, here's a point. It doesn't matter what size institution you are, you're vulnerable and, and you're at risk. And I think one of the challenges a lot of the small and mid-sized banks have, in my experience, has been um, the business people and, and the senior executives in those institutions thinking that because they're a small or medium-sized institution and and you know they operate pretty much in low-risk jurisdictions or with low-risk or lower-risk products, you don't really need to pay attention to this, and, and so consequently the compliance folks who, as Angel described, should be responsible or should have a component uh, to conduct these investigations don't get the resources they need and, and the support that they need from management. So in, in part, it's educating your management that regardless of your size, regardless of what you think, you are vulnerable, and and to, to then ensure that you put that mechanism in place in terms of the resources. So I think it's a, the, the big challenge is a resource challenge, and and you know I I've worked with particularly this one institution. It's a major institution, and one of the things that you've got to do here is you have to build um, an FIU process that is specific to your institution. And, and it goes to that old saying, one size doesn't fit all. It's got to be specific to your needs. It's specific to your risks, specific to your intelligence. For instance, the institution I just mentioned, they um, operate throughout the world. They're global, and they they thrive in very high-risk areas. So their financial intelligence function is critically important. And And when I first got involved with them, they were understaffed in terms of financial intelligence, and they didn't really have a, a a robust financial intelligence process where now they do, and they develop channel reports and, and, and intelligence reports to deal with those types of risks. Now, going back to the smaller institutions, uh, you know, certainly it doesn't have to be on that scale, but there really needs to be a dedicated resource to keep that process, as Angel pointed out so well, centralized and 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 to be able to to deal specifically with the problems that you've got. Thanks. The uh, the polling results. It's a it's a nice cross section of institutions. We have 
obviously a lot of large institution representatives, but a good portion of medium and small as well. And then in terms of the types of institution, uh, we have um, traditional banks make up a good portion, as, as well as others. So I'm assuming that's consultants and law enforcement and that. Uh, Angel, to go to uh, let's go to the purpose of your FIU. One of the things that uh, it's I look at this and it, it looks overwhelming. It looks you you want all of these uh, uh, roles and responsibilities in there. I'm sure it's a connect point to some degree, but there's a lot here. Can you walk us through the the FIU build here? Because obviously, if you can get all of these sorts of skills within your FIU, this is going to be pretty compelling stuff. But talk a little bit about each and and what do you mean? Do you want the staff within the FIU or just to have of involvement like for something like exam management can you walk us through this sure and and you know every again financial institution may may do it obviously differently and and the idea again is i want to take it back to that central centralization of, of information right so um now that you kind of know what field you're playing on right um little minor major you can kind of think about what makes the most sense for the scope because at the end of it the, all of the things listed on here i know there's a lot and, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by each, um, but all of these things are going to be central and core to having a strong AML program within your financial institution, regardless of size. Um, and then again, depending on uh, resources, and, and I know that that's a huge pain point um, for a lot of institutions and organizations, how are you going to best utilize your resources? Um, and, and I've just found that, you know, kind of the old mantra of, um, that you, the core that you look at, you think about for uh, an investigative process, which is get all your data together, normalize it and centralize it, and then you're able to analyze it properly and get to a good conclusion, maybe catch the bad guy in the end. It's kind of the same thing um, with uh, an AML program, right? If you centralize a lot of the flow of data at the very least, if not the functions, but at least the flow of data, you're going to be able to report out um, an, a much more uh, inclusive and big picture to whoever you're responsible to report to, be it the board, auditors, regulators. So with data gathering, it's any type of data. If you're talking about investigations, do you have access to every data point for every product and service within your financial institution, and is it the right kind of data? Um, so if you are... Um, you already have kind of a centralized investigative data point, um, then what's the outcome of that? How does that look for your overall program? Because um, how you build your investigative unit is going to affect uh, how you then analyze it and enhance it, right? So if we're talking investigations, you know, at the very core of it, uh, the best way to conduct an investigation is have all of the data in one place and then analyze it. Once that happens, you have the decisioning of all of that, of all of those items. So if you're if you're talking about a SAR process, then how many um, alerts are you generating? How many SARs are you filing based on those alerts? And we're hearing a lot more, uh, you know, focus uh, from various regulators on how monitoring rules are being generated, um, how all of those things and the outcome of each of those things and enhancement of each of those things will then rely on and have a role in how you QA and QC your program. Uh, so uh, once all of that is kind of gathered together, the, when exams, exams occur, they're going to ask about each and every part um, of, the, uh, of your program. So uh, exam management is a piece where I think sometimes it's often separated from what you would consider in a, your core investigative unit uh, or intelligence. And that's why I stress again intelligence, because investigations is only part of the intelligence of your overall organization. Uh, but if all of the, if your investigations and your SAR decisioning um, and your monitoring role programs are all kind of feeding into one core centralized information network, uh, then you're able to better respond to questions and exams. You have the same people talking to each other. Um, you're able to better create, and we're on the next slide now, um, metrics and reporting. So regardless of whether or not it's one unit or two units or two groups of people, so long as the data flows into one centralized place and everybody is talking to each other, um, you are then able to put together your metrics and reporting uh, to ensure that uh, your, your uh, 
delivering the right message and, and an appropriate and clear message to all of the audiences that you may be responsible for. Um, and kind of knowing your field, again, whether it's, you know, you have one team or two teams or three teams, um, it's really about what your institution can handle and what makes the most sense. So, for example, if an institution is made up of two or three legal entities, depending on uh, what the agreements are, you may not have data uh, in a centralized location. So what structure will you need to put in place in order to coordinate the information flow between those three legal entities? Um, and that's the same with investigation coordination. If you are able to kind of centralize everything in one place, that's probably the, the kind of best case scenario. You're able to see everything. Um, but if not, and then how do you coordinate various investigations? I know a lot of financial institutions conduct fraud investigations in one place and AML investigations in another, internal investigations in another. How do those three pillars or those three different groups then talk to each other? Because what we're seeing more and more is an expectation that at the highest levels in the organizations and financial institutions, someone's got to know what's going on. So how do we ensure that? Um, one of the uh, things that we thought about is, well, what parts of an AML program make the most sense to be part of a financial intelligence unit? I think it's pretty common that the SAR process is, is really um, at the core of it, part of the financial intelligence unit. But what about, you know, sanction screening? What about PEPs investigations? What about EDD? Does it make sense for, say, a, a line of business compliance team to be working on that um, and to be responsible for the kind of research uh, and the information digging around those items? Or does, that, does it make sense to feed that into the financial intelligence unit? Again, responsibility to screen, uh, conduct sanction screening. What happens if there's a match? Does it make sense that the institution then further investigates that? If it's two different teams, it what kinds of communication channels do you have in place to ensure that that data is flowing into a place that it's going to be reported out properly? Um, hey, Angel, can I, can I just stop you there? And Jim, I, I'm curious your views on that, on what Angel just described. How do you figure out where the FIU should play a role and where they should be the lead role, you know, based on those different and di disparate uh, issues, you know, EDD, sanctions, PEP screening, as she mentioned, if you get a hit, what do you do with it? What What's the thought process at Ally to, to make those decisions? Uh, sure, John. Uh, I, I will tell you it all begins and ends with the SAR. Uh, and I, I don't think you have to go very far other than look at the recent enforcement actions or criminal counts that are um, in the front pages of, of newspapers all around. Uh, there, uh, there is a gatekeeper mentality amongst uh, regulators and law enforcement. And the suspicious activity reporting is where it all comes down to. So you don't just have to have intelligence on your customers. Uh, you have to have intelligence on the other functions in your organization. So at Ally, we have SAR coordinators in our fraud side. So we have individuals in the, and we call it a financial crimes intelligence unit, that work directly with the fraud individuals, that their only job is to coordinate uh, the SARs, to know exactly what's going on in their space, uh, specialists in a specialty. And uh, we work on it there. I, I, I cannot uh, emphasize enough uh, that whether you're looking at uh, little league, uh, minor leagues, or major league, uh, the criminals are doing the same. The money launderers are doing the same. Uh, many would say that it could view based on amounts and, and volumes and, and, and timing uh, that they could make a case to actually utilize minor league or even little league financial institutions for their nefarious gains. Uh, and that's why, jumping back a, a concept or two, uh, it doesn't matter what you call it, uh, but what you do have to do is be clear on where the responsibilities are inside the organization and so that any regulator who talks to anyone in the financial institution, that they can point clearly to where that responsibility lies. Uh, but for us, it all starts and ends with the suspicious activity report. That's that precious moment for you to gather intelligence and act as a unified group uh, it's a pinch point, and, and we leverage it. Thanks, Jim. Um, I want to let the audience know we are going to go at least 10 minutes over. There's a couple of points we want to make so, sure we drive home. We are getting questions from folks, and, again, I said we will respond to those questions. I do want to move on a little bit, Angel, because I think part of 
what people are very very interested in is is the next uh, the next slide, and that's you know putting together this dream team. So the structure of the organization, who you need, what kind of skills, all those things that become pretty important. So uh, want you to drive home some of these points here, and then Dennis obviously weigh in as well because you given the work you've done with clients, I know you've been asked to recommend people and skill sets as well. So uh, walk us through how you put this team together. Sure. Um, And, you know, I think, again, starting from the core of it, um, it's about investigations. It's about the SAR process. It's about the ability to decision appropriately um, and ensure that uh, when you are asked about your process and asked about your decisioning, that you're confident in the process that you've built. So at the core of it is this dream team. Who is that? Um, How do you organize it? How do you structure it? Um, What does the FIU, again, look like? And that will depend in part on scope and what, you know, what you want the core FIU team to be responsible for. Um, So, you know, again, it's part of the SAR process. Um, Is the FIU wholly responsible for the SAR process? Uh, Do you have a monitoring role development team that relies on the output of investigations to create uh, stronger and enhanced monitoring roles to better identify potentially suspicious activity? Do you have a team that's specifically responsible for the quality of the work that uh, the investigators are working on? Is it just about the investigations? Is there a written product? So, of course, um, a lot around the actual narrative itself, but not just the narrative of SR, but also the documentation um, and the the support that you have when you do not file a SAR, and I'll often say that that's almost even more important because those are the cases and the decisions that we're making every day where um, it's not going to be reported out. Um, And how do you organize that? So do you have a team of investigators, and then do you have a quality assurance team? Do you have a SAR filing team? Are they one or two or three? Um, And do you also, again, bring in monitoring rules, SAR quality? Um, Do you bring in uh, a, a reporting team? Um, so e- though you have this SAR process, you'll always be asked in a financial institution, well, ha- what's the program doing? Is it successful? How do you measure success? Are your monitoring rules working? So do you have a team focused on just uh, looking at and creating uh, reports of the work, not about the data a- a- analytics of the investigations, but now it's about the actual operational work, how many alerts are generating, how many people do you need? The age-old question of is your staff – do you have a staff that's adequate to manage your inventory? Um, so you may need a whole other team to focus just on the daily metrics and the operations that are running day to day to ensure that you have enough players on the field. Dennis, um, uh, your view about like resources. If someone comes to you and says, take a look at our institution, where do we need help? Uh, and let's focus specifically on the FIU or the in- or the uh, or the central intelligence team, whatever, however it's created. How do you make an assessment of where they need assistance? Again, you know, it goes to the institution. It's specific to the institution we're looking at. And and one of the things I start to look at is the case management system, um, and particularly where you've got different silos or different groups. Um, are they assess are they getting access to the same information so to me one of the starting points in terms of that is is to have that case management system or a case management system that goes across the different silos where people can access because i've seen some issues where either um different entities within the institution uh like a fraud group and an AML group um are doing the same thing or are not one is doing one thinks that the other is doing it when the other thinks the same thing and consequently neither do it and and I've seen some regulatory problems there when regulators come in and say wait a minute uh this was totally missed and and so you know I, I look at that information flow first to how is information flowing across lines and, and then you you look for instance one institution I'm working with uh, I think the key point should be their FIU, and their FIU has developed a very robust process and has incorporated pretty much what what um, Angel has described, and and consequently they didn't have the resources they needed, 
and and I recommended that resources from the investigative side, because um, they had a separate investigative side, be be used to augment what was going on in the FIU, and they balanced the resources a bit. Um, and and again, I think it, it it goes to the specifics with the, each institution, and and what happens. And then yeah, I, I think I mentioned this point, but I'll reiterate it: is that if you do have an investigative process separate and apart from your FIU. Are they taking the work product and the intelligence information that the FIU is developing and using that to to help and facilitate their investigations, or are they neglecting to use that and they're conducting the same the same in, um, review and and assessment uh, work? And and quite frankly, the investigators tend not to do it as well as as the analysts who are in an FIU and and so there's there's a miss there and there's there's certainly um certainly an overlap that 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 causes a lack of effectiveness in the institution so i mean we could all we all say that we we could use more resources but do you reuse your resources to their maximum efficiency i think that's what i look for john i was getting long winded but but how effectively and efficiently are you using your resources to complement each other? Right. Hey, Jim, just quick on training. We talked about retention issues before, but just in general, what what are you trying to get out of uh, training? Again, th- the levels are going to be different. The skills are going to be different. You've mentioned that up front. But as you're putting your training program together, let's just simply talk about your internal training. Obviously, selfishly, we hope you come to us for training. But internally, when you're trying to figure out what the FIU staff needs to know on a regular basis. What goes into that thought process? Sure. First of all, we don't look at training just as a simple one-way uh, flow. Uh, we look at it as a way to grow our professionals inside. So uh, when we do our training, we have folks step up, cases of interest. Uh, we create uh, uh, discussion groups, uh, AML trends, and these things are all led by the investigators and the people in the FIU uh, for, to no small degree. So uh, it, it has more than just the movement of information down. It's, it's also about growing leaders uh, and, and people seeing the opportunities. But ha- having said that, though, uh, when, we, when we are doing training, we, we consider it as formal and informal. So we've got the formal uh, that would be extremely typical, and then we have the informal. So it will be nothing, and we encourage this, for groups of investigators huddled around understanding something or a team leader taking them away uh, and discussing something new that they're seeing and then communicating it. And I also think the training, and this goes back to Angel's point, when we talk about the breadth of the FIU, that investigations has to be training operations, right? Operations has to be uh, informing investigations, programs. Uh, the, the training can't just simply be inside the mini silos inside the FIU. Uh, what the investigators see will inform the people who are uh, loading data, reviewing data, seeing gaps. Uh, so I, I think it goes, it's far wider, and I think we need an expansive view of how we do training and what constitutes training. I think also then when we send people to formal uh, uh, events, such as those sponsored by, by ACAMS, there's a responsibility for those individuals to come back and give us a top ten list of the things that they thought were uh, interesting, the trends, the things that they were saying. Uh, so they kind of bring that back, and it also just shows the value. And then the f- people know that when they're uh, at these conferences or the, uh, we're devoting time, that they understand that that's the benefit for the entire group and that the folks are really engaged in learning. Uh, thanks, Jim. And we, Jim and I did not plan that last point, but to that point, we at ACAMS at our conferences going forward are going to make sure that any of our panels end with takeaways, so very specific things at the end of a discussion or presentation that you'll, that your staff or you will get specific takeaways that the panel is recommending, because we do think sometimes that's what happens. People go to the conferences, obviously we believe they're learning, but they don't always take that information back to their institution, so we're going to help that along by trying to make that a much more formal part of our process. This last slide kind of culminates everything. I do want to spend a couple of minutes. I did say we go a little bit over with some questions. And the first question, Dennis, I want to go back to you. Somebody asked this. I think it's actually a very good good question. How do you alter the mindset of checklists? They, they amplify the question with this. They said, what's the strongest argument you can use to sway senior executives? 
These executives are intelligent. They read case studies. They know about financial crime and risks. But a lot of times it's easier uh, to be satisfied with checklists. So how do you talk them out of that? That's that's uh, that's very interesting, and and it's very very true because that that happens all the time, and and you know you've got to you've got to develop an investigative mindset. You've got to get away from that, and and it it doesn't happen overnight. It's an incremental process, and you've got to start educating where you can, and 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 demonstrating to um, to that executive management. That, that you need to look beyond the checklist because with the checklist you're going to miss things and and ultimately that's going to that that can come back and 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 bite the institution and certainly hurt the institution's reputation if you've got any specific examples you know you can flag that for them but the thing is you've got to be patient it's an incremental process and you've got to keep working on it and and you've got to and and you've got to be persistent until you're able to 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 to, to start to get that sea change and, and to get people to move forward with that idea of having that investigative mindset and, and being open to the investigations. And, and, and clearly, when, when you start to move in that direction, you actually you are going to see a much better um, investigative process. You're going to see much better results. And, and so at the end of the day, I think there, there is a cost effectiveness and a cost savings to an institution but but you know that's another question and and um how you establish those metrics and measurements is 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 difficult john i go, it's jim i would go even further than that i i you know we i have a belief that you live by the checklist you die by the checklist if you live by the checklist it's going to be deficient and you're going you're going to miss something and then when the regulators come or law enforcement knocks on your door and say why didn't you catch it you're going to point to a checklist which is either out of date or had not been followed. If you have, and we all know there has to be some type of checklisting, but if you have that in addition to these other types of forums, uh, the communication channels, uh, integration of function, uh, you've got a whole lot more to point to, to the regulators and the law enforcement. For, you're going to get a higher yield, but you're also going to be able to make a much more three-dimensional case around your efforts on investigations. Well Thanks. Stated, um, Angel, another question that came up that I it's it's not off it's not off point, but it's it's certainly relevant to the challenge of fraud and AML being separate in institutions as as an FIU may be from the AML division. If they are separate, which department takes ownership of filing SARS or is there a centralized team that should file? So I guess this is more of a recommendation. What do you recommend? Should the should the BSA office always file the SARS? If fraud is separate, if the FIU is separate, just what what from your sense is a good best practice? Um, to me, it's it's the team that's most qualified to file the SAR. So, in other words, the team that is most educated in the requirements, uh, that has the best writing skills, um, that is able to tell a story to a third party um, and put together all of the information and data uh, that is necessary uh, in filing a SAR. Um, so it's, it's whoever is best qualified, and it could be really in any of those uh, on any of those teams, um, so long as the process. Uh, and the structure and the talent is there. I've got one more for the panel, and I'm assuming just by the language that this is probably uh, someone outside the states. The question for the panel is: What about tipping off when there are different units uh, that are working de- together in terms of SARS or STR? So again, going back to Angel's point, she's saying who's best qualified. If a lot of different divisions are involved, I'm assuming the question means. Uh, what sort of process do you put in place to ensure that there's there's no tipping off? I mean, certainly there's training involved, but is this is this something that um, is a particular challenge or question that comes up, Jim? I guess I'll start with you. You know, it, it hasn't been, I, I, John. I just very keenly. Everyone knows how sacred the SAR is for us and how we control it. Our SAR coordinators kind of reemphasize that, so we've got these limited. We've got these limited compartments of knowledge about each one of the SARS. Uh, we could maybe that's it. Maybe we could readily trace it back if there was an issue. But uh, knock on wood, we we just have not seen much of that. We we cover off on on a ton of training, right? Um, as well. That makes sense. John, and, Angel, you're experience. a little obviously international. Same same question. Um, 
Yeah, and, you know, we, we also haven't had any issues with it. I think the key to that is, and I want to clarify a little bit um, on my last comment, which is, you know, whatever team is most responsible or most um, uh, uh, has the most experience. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's important that it should be a centralized team, right? And so it's the control of the data and control of the knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, so long as, that resides within one location in a centralized location, um, you're not going to have an issue with the tipping off in conjunction with the training and so on. And, and again, it should be a compliance, like to me, a compliance function um, where that kind of standard is already embedded in the minds of, of its employees. Well, again, I want to thank both the audience, obviously, for staying with us. Sorry we went a little bit over, but I, as you can see, there's a lot to talk about I also obviously want to thank Dennis, Angel, and Jim for not only today but all the work they've done for the organization in putting this together. A lot of the questions that came in related to what you need to apply for the CAMS FCI school, we have frequently asked questions on the website. You can just take a look at that. You can certainly contact uh, Jeff Phone that you see there on the screen, or you certainly can send me an email. We'd be happy to respond. On some of the other questions related to the creation of FIUs, we will put those questions together and get a response back to the audience. Again, I just want to thank everybody for the time today. This is a very important part of the AML mission, and that's financial intelligence. And 10, 15 years ago, we wouldn't even be talking about this. And so this is not only important, uh, but the regulators want to see they want to see value, they want to see structure, and obviously it just makes for a better run institution. So again, I want to thank everybody for their time today. Enjoy the rest of your week and weekend, and we'll be back in touch. Thank you.